This is a short video essay on Psycho. Just about every avenue of culture has appropriated and spoiled the contents of this film already, long before you decided to take my class, but just in case you haven't seen it, watch the movie now before proceeding further. Part of Psycho's enduring popularity as a horror film is not just its provocative imagery and lighting, but its position in film history as an avant-garde movie. What with its oblique narrative shape, odd misdirects, and a final shot that suggests a heroic mute or silent protagonist, it's sort of no surprise that this film spawned three sequels, a shot-for-shot -shot remake in the 90s, and a successful five-season spin-off show, Bates Motel, produced in 2013 by Universal Television, formerly known as Review Studios, the company who initially hired Hitchcock for his television work. Aesthetically, Psycho belongs in the world of TV, not film. Shot in crisp black and white, Psycho was photographed by famed cinematographer John L. Russell, dubbed by Orson Welles as the greatest camera operator in cinema history. Russell was a black and white film specialist who collaborated with Hitchcock on almost 100 projects if we count individual episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, a TV series of 30-minute episodes that aired for seven seasons starring in 1955. And, after it was extended in length and renamed The Alfred Hitchcock Hour, ran an additional three seasons starting in 1962. Russell's cinematography can be seen in two of the highest rated episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents from season three. The premiere episode, The Glass Eye, starring Jessica Tandy, and episode 28, Lamb to the Slaughter, starring Barbara Belgettis. Both of these episodes were made before his work on Psycho. It stands to reason that because of the controversial script and subject matter of Psycho, with its frank depictions of sex, nudity, and murder, major studios would deny Hitchcock the budget he had come to expect from his previous work. But because Review Studios, like many entities in the television industry, was reaching the pinnacle of its power, backed by advertisers and supported by talent agencies such as MCA, Hitchcock was able to make the film he wanted to make at a reduced cost with a crew accustomed to the fast production style of TV. You know, I sometimes consider getting out of this business. Psycho earned John Russell his deserved Oscar nomination for black and white cinematography. Technology is also a reason why this film looks so TV. By the end of the 1950s, the television cameras that were still designed to shoot in black and white, even though the film world had already moved on to color, used a vastly improved film stock even from the film used on Spellbound and Notorious. The result is a film that is more contrasty, a greater ratio between the darkest part of the image and the lightest part of the image. It was most likely one of the best looking films of its day. These days, a Blu-ray is probably the best format with which to watch the film if you are looking for this distinct visual contrast. The stabbing string sounds in Bernard Herrmann's score to Psycho is inextricably tied forever to not only Hitchcock himself, who is becoming somewhat of a star and celebrity, but the horror genre. The idea of using a stabbing motion to the string section during the shower scene worked so well, Hitchcock deemed that it was the soundtrack itself that saved the picture from potential ruin. This was not Herman's last experience with horror, as he too, like Russell, worked on a good amount of Hitchcock TV, the scariest of which is the Alfred Hitchcock Hour episode, An Unlocked Window, from 1965, which he scored after The Birds and Marnie. Narratively, the film is like two disparate episodes to an unmade miniseries. Consisting of two halves, the first story is one of karma, and the second is about the ever-timely subject of mental illness. Of perhaps even more interest is the fact that the first hour of this movie is a story told using sound. Recall the internal dialogue of Marion Crane as she drives from one city to the next. I believe that Janet Leigh and many of the other actors in this film knew that the director wanted this. There are many times where you can almost see that the actors are holding on to a scene, being uncharacteristically quiet because they know they are acting against a silent character, sound. There are many questions I still have when I rewatch this film. I wonder if Janet Lee knew what lines were running through her character's mind at the time her driving shots were filmed. Was the dialogue played back on set for her to react to? At the 25 minute mark of the film, a remarkable juxtaposition happens of her smiling while violent dialogue plays through in her mind. 
I'll get it back, and if any of it's missing, I'll replace it with her fine, soft flesh. I'll track her, never you doubt it. Oh, hold on, Cass. I still can't believe... It must be some kind of a mystery. I, I can't... You check with the bank, no? They never laid eyes on her, no? You still trusting? Hot creeper, she sat there while I dumped it out. Hardly even looked at it. Planning, and, and even flirting with me. It is almost too perfect, as if she's enjoying the thrill of the chase. It makes one wonder, too, if the conversation between Norman and his mother is imagined by Marion as well. By candlelight, I suppose, in the cheap erotic fashion of young men with cheap erotic minds. She is way too far from the house to actually hear people talking. And while she does confirm with Bates that she's heard his mother, their ensuing conversation in Bates's metaphorical birdcage is so strange it suggests metaphor rather than realism. A son is a poor substitute for a lover. Perhaps Marion and Bates are psychic echoes of each other. Maybe they both inhabit an alternate reality where good and evil battle each other out. Both Marion and Bates are in relationships with a partner they seem trapped with. When Marion steals the 40000 from Tom Cassidy earlier in the film, Tom originally tells her that this money is for a new house. Marion steals the money and is killed by a man living in an unoccupied house. Also, what is the significance of the bird names? Marion Crane from Phoenix, Arizona. I guess we will have to watch one more Hitchcock film to find out. Thanks for watching, everyone.